day. Welcome to yet another episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Muir. I'm an ADF product manager based in Perth, Australia. Now it's in a very exciting day on the ADF Architecture TV channel today because Oracle, you know, it's got a lot of money. It's decided to spend a little bit of it. And today in the ADF Architecture TV channel, we have a brand new prop to include. So this is going to be the pride, center and joy of all my future episodes of recording for the ADF Architecture TV channel. And we'll just put it right there so you can just bask on this fantastic little poster, which by the looks of it looks like it's about 10 years out of date. But you know, Oracle spares no expenses with these sort of things. So in today's episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel, what we're going to look at is the final part of the previous episodes where we've been talking about the banner task load transaction options. So over a number of episodes here, we've been talking specifically about transactions, data controls, the BTF or the banner task flow data control scope option, the transaction options, and what I'd like to talk about in today's episode is a concept I call the prematurely terminating task flow. Now it's a term that I've made up, but I think it's not a bad name for describing the sort of problem we're going to hit here. Now, what are prematurely terminating task flows? Well, if you think about a normal bounded task load, it typically terminates through a task load return activity. So at some point, the application in the BTF will navigate to that task load return activity. It may or may not issue a commit and rollback, but at that point, it closes the BTF down, the bounded task load, and returns to the caller. Now, that would be a normal termination of the task flow. But a prematurely termina terminated task flow is one which is well, obviously abnormal. And the two scenarios that I know of that this occurs is where you say have a banner task flow which is based on fragments and the parent page or the parent banner task flow that wraps that child banner task flow uh, fragment essentially causes the child to refresh or terminate before it's actually finished completing its job before it's actually got to the uh, task flow return commit that it has it configured. There is another scenario as well, and that is where the user, through using the, user, uh, using the browser back button, causes a BTF that's currently running to be terminated earlier than it was expected as well. So with that description in mind of the prematurely terminated task flows, let's actually have a look at a real scenario to give you a bit better understanding of how this can occur. So imagine we have this example. We have a bounded task flow that shows some departments data. And as you can see here, it's an editable form with also the first, previous, next, last buttons. Now the department's task flow has the options always begin new transaction and an isolated data control scope set. Now just for the purposes of understanding the uh, scenarios of the prematurely terminated task flows that we're about to talk about, we've also added some logging in order to show what's actually going on under the covers in terms of which task flows are being initialized and which task flows are being finalized, and also the application modules that are potentially being created and shut down and so on. So from the output here, now this is logging output that I've added myself to this particular set of this task flow, we can see that, well, it, when the uh, task flow is rendered, the department start is rendered, you can see that the task flow is saying, hey, I was initialized. And because that task flow then accesses the department's view object, which is exposed through an application module, we can see uh, the root application module being created and it's prepared session call occurring. And that means it's taking a connection out of the database. And let's extend this example a little bit by then looking at, well, maybe on the screen what we'll also do is conclude a call in a region to another bounded task flow that happens to show the relating employees information. Now this example is a little contrived because normally we'd set up a master detail screen to do this. But in terms of configuring our applications, there is no issue about building two separate bounded task flows, one to show departments and the other one to show the employees information relating to that department if we then pass the, the uh, department ID through to that second bounded task flow in order to, for, so it can work out what actually needs to be displayed in terms of the employee's data. Now in context of that second task flow, we can see that it uses the use existing transaction if possible option and a shared data control scope. Now because it's using a shared data control scope here, 
This means that the behavior of the use existing transaction if possible option will be dynamic and it will look at is there already a data control frame and transaction underway. And indeed there is, the previous bounded task flow has a brand new data control frame and uh, a transaction underway. So as such, the, the second bounded task flow will happily join to that. In terms of the logging when that second bounded task flow was rendered, in addition, we will also see that it is initialized. So here you can see the employee's task flow initialized. But because of what we mentioned earlier on, because of the magical ability, I always call it the auto magical ability of the banner task flow transaction options to force the underlying application modules of the banner task flows to share connections, we can actually see on the second logging line here that rather than creating another root AM which might have been configured in the employer's task flow, that in fact that root AM is created as a nested AM under the parent root AM from the original task flow. Now the mechanism there is a little bit a uh, little bit complex to understand what's going on but basically in order for the root application modules to share connections what ADF does, or maybe ADF Business Components does under the covers, is the second root application module that comes along is automatically nested under the first root AM. So that's why we see what we see here. Now imagine the user on the screen who can now see both view objects and ultimately both bounded task flows, then clicks the next button. Okay. Now the next button, of course, will force the department's view object to walk onto the next record. But in addition, that department ID will then be written or grabbed, I should say, from the parent task flow here, the department's task flow, and given to the employee's task flow same name parameter. In addition, that particular task flow, the region or the task flow binding has its refresh option set to if needed. And this is the example where the second task flow now is prematurely terminated because that refresh that automatically happens by the framework in updating the employee's task flow actually shuts down the previous instance of that task flow and restarts it. And to prove that, in the logging, you'll actually see that the employee's task flow is finalized and then it is reinitialized. So again, to be clear here, effectively that second task flow, because it didn't actually reach its task flow return, it was the parent task flow caused a change in one of the parameters of the employee's task flow and the if needed refresh option forces it to automatically stop and restart with the brand new uh, employee ID. This is what is called a prematurely terminated task flow. So as I mentioned before, there are literally two scenarios which are the uh, prematurely terminated task flows can be observed and you've seen one here. Typically, it's a fragment-based BTF where the parent BTF forces the child BTF to restart or refresh. There is also a page-based scenario, as I mentioned, and that really occurs where the user makes use of the browser back button, causing maybe you've called one BTF based on pages, and that causes the browser or the application to go back to a previous bounded task flow, and only until the user clicks on part of the, uh, the original screen Suddenly the framework will realize, well, I thought the user was on this banner task flow, but now they're over here, so they must have used the back button, and that will call this a termination. But that does bring up an interesting question that, okay, we've got this concept of prematurely terminating task flows, but so what? As we saw in the previous scenario, it still seems to work okay. Well, the question is though, what happens if we've got a transaction underway with those banner task flows? If those banner task flows actually have edited the transaction on the data control frame and we've undertaken a, n a number of pieces of work on, as example, the underlying uh, data control instances, the ADFBC data control instance as example, well, what happens to the transaction? Do we end up with messed up data or does the framework have a graceful way of handling this? Well, it does. It does detect the situation and it will wind back any changes that are necessary to wind back. And it has sort of an auto-magical rollback feature. However, it can cause some interesting results from the user's perspective and can cause them to go, Hup, what's going on? So let's have a look at one of those scenarios now, again, diagrammatically, so you might understand where you get this sort of behavior and what, what the user's experience would be. So let's return to the example that we had before, but with a very subtle change.
As you can see, we've still got the department's task flow showing the department's data and it's sitting on record 20. The minor change here though is the department's task flow, rather than using one of the transaction options, is using the no controller transaction option. And you might remember what that means it is essentially that the banner task flow is not going to participate in with any data control frame or any, uh, any transaction on the frame. So in that way, it's really up to the programmer if they want to commit or roll back the underlying data control instance, they'll have to uh, programmatically, or I should say implicitly call the data control palette commit and rollbacks for, in this example, the ADF business component data control. Just so we're proving we though we've still got the same, uh, pretty much the same behavior under the covers, we can still see the department's task flow initialized and we can see the associated application module for the department's view object that's created and a prepare session is called, which is causing a connection to be taken out of the database. Now again, just to highlight, you notice that the user here is on record 20. And in addition, we've got the no controller transaction option, which means that, again, the controller has no data control frame or controller level transaction occurring. Now let's introduce our second bound of task flow, just as we saw earlier on. Now a second bound of task flow is pretty much exactly the same. It shows, it's designed to show the employee's data for the relating department ID. It works out how to do that based on an employee ID passed in from the, uh, the calling task flow. But in terms of the task flow transaction options, it has use existing transaction if possible set and shared data control scope set. Hmm, now there's the interesting thing, right? Because the shared data control scope here implies that the behavior of the use existing transaction if possible option is dynamic at runtime and it's based on what the previous task flow is doing. Now what the previous task flow is doing here is it's not participating in a data control frame or a controller level transaction. So from the perspective of the employee's task flow it goes, ah, oh, well in that case if there's no data control frame or transaction underway at the controller layer, then I must be the one that's initiating that. So I will actually default to the equivalent of always begin new transaction behavior. It will create the data control frame and it will create the transaction. Okay, so from its perspective, it really thinks it's the guy that's initiating the transaction. Again, under the covers, we can see from the logging that the task flow was initialized, that is the employer's task flow, and the relating application module here is nesting under the root AM of the original department's task flow. So everything is kind of as we understand it now. Now in the previous scenario, the user then clicked on the next button to move the department's view object onto the next record. Now as soon as we do that in this scenario, we see a very interesting thing occur because A, yes, the employee's task flow is finalized, and we saw that last time, but B, hmm, look what's happening on the root AM. Now this didn't happen before. We can see in red there that a rollback has been called, and then the employee's task flow is being reinitialized, presumably with the new employee ID. My goodness, why has a rollback occurred on the root AM? What on earth is the framework doing here? Well, you might remember from previous episodes in terms of the banner task flows with the transaction options, which ones are responsible for actually issuing commits and rollbacks. It's always the task flow that initiates the data control frame and the transaction as such. So in this case, the second task flow, because of its interaction with the first task flow, it goes, well, there's no data control frame, there's no transaction, I must be the equivalent of an always begin new transaction task flow. So in that case, if I happen to terminate, what the framework then says, well, if I happen to terminate and I'm the one that was controlling the transaction and all the work, well, I better do a rollback to undo any of the work here. Now that's ex actually good behavior. We want that behavior, but can you understand what issue we're now going to get into in the very next, uh, in the very next thing that's gonna occur in the actual framework? Well, what's going to occur is the user is going to discover, even though they've clicked on that next button, it doesn't move to record 30. Now why? Well, if you're quite familiar with ADF business components, you'd be familiar that a rollback causes the iterators to reset back to the first position. Now, in this case, the rollback happened on the second task flow, but because we had that shared data control scope option and the 
application module of the employer's task flow has nested under the root application module, the rollback on the root AM has caused not only uh, ultimately the employer's view object to reset itself, our rollback and reset its iterator, but also the department's view object iterator to reset itself back to the first position in the overall set of department's data. So even though the user here might click, keep on attempting to click the next button, okay, again and again and again, the really interesting thing that's going to occur here is that the department's view object is never going to be able to walk on to another record because you've got that rollback occurring, which is causing all the iterators to set back to their first record in their record set. So this is a really interesting example of not only the prematurely terminated transaction, but a combination of the transaction options on the banner task flows where they will not interplay correctly. You might remember from a previous episode, I was quite clear where I said, don't mix the transaction options, that is the always begin new transaction, always use existing transaction, and use existing transaction if possible options, with the other option, no controller transaction. The other option really isn't an option, it's really saying turn that behavior off, and it's really designed orthogonally to those other three options. So don't intermix these options because you get these sort of scenarios and it really becomes quite complex to understand what's going on. And that really concludes what I wanted to discuss today in terms of prematurely terminated task flows and prematurely terminated task flow transactions. Now just before concluding the episode though, I'd like to share on the screen with you three links. Two of the links are actually two previous blog articles that I've written to describe the two use cases under which, I should say the two scenarios, under which that you'll see the prematurely terminating task flow scenario. The third link is actually a link to an application, a demo application, which you can actually uh, play with to actually see this behavior. And the screenshots that we were just seeing that there were actually based off that little demo application. Um, just remember though to check the bounded task flow behavior, transaction options, and data control scope options because there's only one little sample application, but there's two scenarios that you need to uh, try out. So you will need to change the options according to the scenario that you're trying to replicate. So once again, thanks very much for joining us in the uh, ADF Architecture TV channel, uh, new prop and all. Um, that really concludes the investigations of the bounded task flow transaction and data control scope options. And in the following episodes, we'll be leaving task flows behind and talking about other design concepts in terms of our ADF applications. So thanks again, and I hope to see you in our next episode very soon.